The following podcast deals with topics such as sexual scenarios and potentially triggering situations like assault. All right, so this is episode two of the pod class series uh, that explores sexual deception. So we're, we're talking about what it means to fake or exaggerate your sexual pleasure. And we're uh, exploring that through the lens of sociology through a qualitative research study. Um, So my name is Anne Elizabeth. I wasn't in the first episode. I was the editor of the first episode, um, but I was in class during the time that it was recorded. Um, You know, because we are all in college and trying to get our degrees, hence the name of the podcast. (laughs) Um, pod class pod class but i'm here now and i'm excited to talk with anna shirley about uh the process of gathering the research that was talked about in episode one yes so i was in the first episode and i'm ready to get into it let's see what we have going for us yeah all right cool so i'm just gonna outline for people who may not know what it is exactly that we did i know you explained in the first episode that each one of us gathered three interviews. Um, So that's a total of 15 people. And so right away, I wanna discuss what's possibly a research limitation, which is that um, it wasn't a broad study. It wasn't very broad. It Um, was mostly our friends. Like we um, went through more of like a snowball research method, like recruiting mm -hmm. our own friends to do it. So there was that um, and there were many females on the study too. Um, yes. So I thought that was a limitation as well. Yeah, there was definitely a gender bias. Now here's something that came up in one of my um, interviews that I wasn't able to touch on because I wasn't present for the first round. But something that um, I also realized was a bias in our work is we have some racial blind spots. Um, one of my subjects, um, a black gay man was telling me about his experiences being either ignored or fetishized for his race. Um, And so that has led him to increase promiscuity because he felt like it was his obligation to accept whatever kind of sexual interest came his way, if that makes any sense. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I I wouldn't know I'm a white female. I exactly experience that. And that's, that's very... That's something that we need to take into account in this research too, because my a lot of, my all my subjects were white. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think everyone on the team is white as well, except for Josh. Um, um, and he he may be white. I just know that he's Latin American, but that's not a race. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm pretty sure he's a Colombian. Is his. Yeah. Or his background. Right. Well, that's his nationality, but nationality. Anyway, I don't the yeah, the point is we didn't we don't have the diversity necessary to make a completely comprehensive uh study that really accounts for these variables. So I was embarrassed um when when my friend brought that up because I was, you know, it just hadn't even ever occurred to me that that might be something that happened. So I really appreciated him being open and honest and vulnerable with me. Um, And I'm excited to get into the writing phase um, so that we can kind of convert what he said into the the paper, I guess. Um, I I think that it's important and um, and I appreciate him just being available to speak up on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of my participants, I'm thankful for their, um, for their contribution in this. Um, and I wish I did have more of a diverse subject background, but. Mm -hmm. So now that we've covered like the limitations of our experiment being the sample size, uh, the fact that we were all kind of friends with the people we interviewed and the fact that we have some biases and blind spots as researchers. Um, maybe we can like lay out what our variables were. So before we do that, I guess we have to state our hypothesis. And I'm pretty sure the consensus is that our hypothesis is we um, believe that if someone is to fake or exaggerate sexual pleasure, 
then the quality of the relationship as a whole will suffer. Would you agree or would you change anything about that? No, I, um, I agree with our hypothesis. Okay, I see it. We hypothesize the quality of relationships suffers when, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. Um, but I do feel like we did get a lot of contradicting research too. Yeah. Um, um, and so, yeah, with that, I would say that the independent variable is the act of faking or exaggerating and the dependent variable is the consequent, the relational consequences of that. Um, now, here's another thing that occurred in my research that I wasn't anticipating at all, which was that, uh, you know, exaggeration or fabrication of pleasure was basically used sometimes as a defense mechanism. I had two subjects tell me that they used it to kind of catalyze um, like the closure of a sexual, like <laughs> they, they would use it to try and encourage the other person to come to an end um, because they were either being coerced into the situation or, um, or forced into the situation. And so by, they thought that they would be minimizing their suffering, I guess. Oh my God, hey, I'm so sorry. No, you're um, fine. They, so they basically thought they would be um, minimizing the negative impact of the encounter if they were able to fake sexual pleasure. Uh, and that was something that really surprised me in the research because I think that we had much more surface level notions of what we were going to find. And so discovering that there are like these other ramifications out there, you know, like faking sexual pleasure because you feel um, because you're having identity issues with your race, like we talked about earlier, or faking sexual pleasure because you're afraid of your partner and you want to minimize damage. Like those are, those are real things and they do happen. Yes. Um, we also thought like, because this study was more like for our friends and stuff like that, people didn't take it too seriously, which could have been a limitation. And so we didn't gather like a lot of um, information about like, you know, like maybe personal trauma. It might, it might have been like more surface level is what we were thinking. Yeah. Um, would be one of the limitations of it. And that's a lot of the research that we gathered um, before was people kind of kind of were joking about it, but then eventually took it way more seriously. Yeah. So I, yeah, I definitely noticed that trend um, with the first um, podcast. So, how do you? Uh, what would you tell people who aren't familiar with our class? Uh, what would you tell them about um, Professor Ferrera's communications course? I mean, I just think it's a chance for us to kind of explore what we want to um, see. It is called communication, what, um, methods and contacts or? Uh, ooh, it's on the protocol. Uh, so it's communications level 336, addressing problems and contacts. Addressing problems and contacts. And I think that's what we're getting a chance to do right now is see, um, see what we want to address and find out more about that, which I think is a really good chance for us to learn individually. And that's what I really like about Professor Ferrar is that she wants us to get the chance for us to do something that we're interested in. And hence the study, here we are. Yeah. Sorry, I'm holding my dog above my head. <laughs> Does that work? Sometimes <laughs> it works. Like if I just, if she's barking and I just lift her up, she'll stop. I think she likes it. I think it's she like- She likes it from up there. Your room uh, looks so cool. Oh, thank you. It's a little bit messy. Um. <laughs> oh my God, same, 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 same. <laughs> um, for those who are not um, in the loop with the format of the podcast, um, we're in a Zoom call. So let's go by, let's go through this then question by question and talk about what we found. All right. So do you wanna take the lead? Yeah, um, so should I go through like all the questions like um, how did you see that like hear about the study? Like what names do you wanna do? 
Yeah, I think to the lay person that could be interesting, uh, just because people who haven't done a lot of qualitative research uh, deserve to kind of be looped in as to what we did before we got into the personal questions. Yeah. All right. So um, question one was, um, how did you hear about this study? And all of my answers were through the interviewer, which was me. So they heard about it for me. Mm -hmm. um, I had the same thing except for one. So two of them were my friends. And then one of them was someone that uh, Professor Ferreira had connected me to. Um, she had volunteered to do the study as extra credit because she's in another one of Ferrara's courses. Um, the reason I had to go with a stranger is because I did originally interview three of my friends, but one of them, the interview was not usable because he did not meet the criteria. Um, and you'll see what we mean by that in a minute, um, but he didn't meet the criteria to complete the interview. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the second question is, um, what do you want your fake name to be? I think that's really important because um, not only did <laughs> we want to make it clear that these people were going to be anonymous, but we wanted to afford them like some agency and choice and, you know, let them have a little bit of fun with it too. Exactly. Um, um, you go ahead. Oh yeah. So I was just going to say that this third question is where that original friend of mine failed. Um, <laughs> have you ever faked sexual pleasure or found out that a partner is faking it with you? Uh, bless his soul. He was like, nope. And we, we still, we went through with the whole interview, um, just in case you know, because why not? But really, um, the inter according to the interview protocol, if, if the answer is no, you're supposed to end the interview there. So eventually yeah. I did replace that interview with um, the person who volunteered from Ferrara's other class. Nice. Yeah, I'm, all of mine said yes. Um, and they were both, um, it was two females and one male. Mm -hmm. um, so the fourth question asks about gender, and then it also asks about assigned gender at birth. Um, this may be another issue with our sample is that I believe all of our subjects, all of our participants were cis. We didn't have any um, transgender uh, people to give us feedback. Um, and gender absolutely does impact your sexual relationships. So that would have been valuable to have heard from someone. Totally. Um, to hear from more people of diverse gender backgrounds. Yeah, um, I would also include that in the limitation of our study is not having that diversity in there too. Yeah. Uh, we also asked about sexuality. I feel like my interviews were um, kind of represented like statistical perfection because I had straight for one of them, gay for another and bisexual for a third. And if you're familiar with like census like researcher, not census, but like a lot of academic literature or sci even scientific literature will have you believe that gay, straight, and bisexual are the only sexualities. So I thought it was funny that my subjects checked every single one of those boxes. Yeah, right? Because um, there's so many more now. Yeah. Well, uh, what about you? How did your subjects identify? They were all straight. Um, it was <laughs> Celeste, Betsy, and Trolls straight gotcha uh yeah I had so Janet was bisexual and she had had sex with men and women two of my subjects did not give me fake names is one of the <laughs> things um <laughs> I'm just gonna call her Clara um so Clara didn't uh Clara was straight and she'd only had sex with men and then I and then okay this third person did give me a fake name but it was the fake it was his fake name was just the name of somebody he was sleeping with and so I'm like I'm gonna change that obviously yeah definitely. so yeah so we're just gonna call him um Casey and Casey is a gay man but he identifies as gay and bisexual um meaning that he's primarily gay he identifies with like the homosexual male culture and um, he feels like that's the term that fits it best. Although he can appreciate the beauty of women, he's only slept with men. Um, and by his own estimate, he's had about 70 sexual partners, um, all men. He said he, he would be open to sleeping with a woman, um, but really he 
Um, and that's why he gives himself the bisexual label, but he prefers the um, specification of being gay and bisexual because uh, gay kind of describes like um, how he fits into the culture of the community and bisexual represents the nuances of who he is. And then he also introduces a third label, which is demisexual. And that means that you have to have a connection with someone before you can feel a sexual attraction. So you need an emotional or intellectual connection. And I found that to be really interesting as well. I would love to see his answers in our questions <laughs> then, because a lot of it does have to do with your emotions. And, yes. And that, you know, sexual encounters and stuff like that. So I'm, let's, let's get into it. I'll start. <laughs> so I, I interviewed Charles and he is um, male, straight, and 22, um, white, and from New York, but it lives in Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, he's had about 80 sexual partners and um, he's like, he knows that several like meaning like three or four have faked it with him and he's only faked it with one partner. Mm -hmm. um, and then Celeste, on the other hand, she, um, sorry, I'm finding it. She is um, straight, 20 years old, white, um, from South Carolina and has had seven sexual partners. Um, and she has faked it with all seven and none of them have disclosed to her that they have faked sexual satisfaction. Um, while Betsy, so Betsy is um, female. She is heterosexual. Um, she's 21, white from South Carolina and um, has had about 30 sexual partners and faked it with half. And none of them have disclosed that they have had, they have faked sexual satisfaction. Yeah, so you um, have now provided kind of some good examples of the background details we gathered on everyone. And later on, this will help us to identify demographic trends um, or perhaps even um, help us to draw conclusions about the specific culture of the people that we're interviewing. One thing that I thought about was how a lot of the students um, that we talked to, they had either been raised in the South or had lived for a long time in the South. And I think that there are different regional attitudes uh, that kind of emerge about uh, sex um, and things of that category. Uh, like I remember the first time I went to New York City and I saw an ad for a vibrator that had the word masturbate in it. And it was just this blatant ad and on the sidewalk. And I was just astounded. I was like, that's so like blatant. I can't believe they just would post that. But I guess that was just my little Southern head exploding because we're really not that open like se about sex and in, in this culture. I agree. Um, I always, I don't know. I always get uncomfortable kind of talking about it, but um. I think that is just how I was raised and especially around my parents I hate that hate yeah. it um but no it is it's it is um a regional thing uh, I think being less open about sex is definitely a southern um culture yes uh and then another so the, I think the first like big question that we ask people is uh besides how many sexual partners you've had in your life, like the first big personal question um, that deals with the topic is explain what it means to have a healthy sexual relationship with someone. Now I can't speak for your results, but for me, the biggest themes were communication first and foremost, and also consent. My themes were more around like when you receive the pleasure like I don't know it's like kind of enjoying each other in a sexual way mm -hmm. um it doesn't always mean finishing but 
just having fun and enjoying spending time in that way. So I think that was that was definitely the emerging theme out of it. Um, yeah, it mostly all of them said like, yeah, all of them said they didn't have to finish. It was just more around like having fun with the whole thing. Yeah. I think that's interesting. And I think that's part of what makes this study so challenging is that sex is so complicated and so different for various individuals that it is really hard to make grand uh, statements about, about it. You know, it's so personal and it, it's, it, there's so much nuance. Yeah, I think everyone definitely has their own their own taste if you know what I mean like they everyone has like a different way they perceive it I guess because it is such a personal thing so Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of fun to get to interview people in this way yeah absolutely so the next question that we asked was uh for people to define sexual satisfaction and for me I got answers more similar to what you're saying people reported on what it means to have a healthy sexual relationship. Uh, so the sexual satisfaction, um, my answers ranged from having an orgasm to just having a, a pleasurable experience, even if not physically, um, just enjoying yourself and mentally like having fun. Yeah, um, for this question, mostly people said orgasm. So I guess like, <laughs> so, and with having a sexual a healthy sexual relationship they just wanted to spend time and have fun but um for sexual satisfaction it was mostly to fill that sexual desire of having an orgasm yes uh then we asked people what it means to fake sexual satisfaction um and i found that that was very much centered around the orgasm people just pretending to have climaxed when they really didn't yeah definitely or like um just like fake moaning like giving them like a like a pleasing look or telling them it feels good um yeah they just most of the people that I interviewed sort of define faking sexual satisfaction and exaggerating sexual satisfaction that's the same thing um which I mean, it does, it does make sense because it does, it's still a um, deceiving way to have sex with someone. Now that, that is true, but something that I found interesting was that um, one person, at least one person um, told me that exaggerating is definitely different um, because exaggeration is almost like going with the flow and performing in a way that hopefully leads to a more fun experience for the performer and for their partner. Um, so she, this was, this was Janet, um, which is obviously her fake name. And she told me that she, um, she, she told me that she's very vain and she loves to hear her own voice. And I thought that was really awesome of her to admit and say. Um, and so, and so definitely we did have some good conversations about the difference between exaggeration and then just blatant faking it all together. Totally. I, I actually got some same answers. Um, it was like, it was for a question I asked later. I forget which one, but it, (laughs) um, two, two of the people I interviewed, Betsy and Celeste said that kind of moaning and like doing stuff like that turns them on more. So if they fake it, they will eventually make it. Exactly. And I thought that was so cool because like relatable, you know? Yes, for sure. Um, we also asked, um, is faking it ever a positive thing? Um, and I want to hear your thoughts on this first. Yeah. Um, so mostly people said like, well, the girl said it can be, but the guy said trolls. He said no, and that's all he gave me. Mm-hmm. So I mean, he obviously has a very strong opinion about that. But um, the girls were just like, "Yeah, it can be because 
it's just like you never want to make someone feel insecure and like you don't want to just like you just don't want to hurt their ego I guess and I mean that's getting into more like why questions but mostly it was just like they thought they thought it could be a good thing for both people too so yeah no exactly um and and I I got that feedback too but then I also, which I mentioned before, I got the answer that it can be positive in the sense that it can be used as a tool to kind of facilitate the end of a sexual situation that you don't want to be in. Oh, totally. Yeah. A lot of people, they, like, if they start faking it, like, those moans and stuff like that, like, is more, is that tool, is that tool to get out of it, like, just to leave the situation totally. Um, and I gathered that too. Um, so on to the next question, who does faking sexual satisfaction serve? Um, mostly everyone said like their partner and, um, like mostly just to like boost their ego and make them feel more comfortable. Um, cause like if you lack, if you lack confidence, you want to go, you wouldn't want to go out of your comfort zone. Yes. I don't, yeah. So, um, it like serves both parties because you can make your partner feel more confident and make them want to do more for you. Yeah. So. Um, I, I've heard, I've heard an argument for both, you know, it serves you, um, because then you don't have to get into a deeper conversation about your needs and what feels good. <laughs> and then, um, it, it serves the other person in terms of they don't have to take the ego hit right away. Um, but that's not to say that they won't eventually discover that maybe they aren't as sexually skilled as they thought they were. Um, so it, it can be a little bit complicated, but, uh, the consensus was typically that it, it can serve both parties in the short term, but it's ultimately going to be a hindrance to their sexual growth for both people. Yeah. Um, we also, then we asked about like the way people exaggerated and faked pleasure. Um, and we already touched on this a little, but it's basically just like um, moaning and verbal confirmations, um, things like that. Facial expressions. Yeah. Um, like even like just telling them that you had an orgasm when you really haven't, like just faking it in that way or I know that um, that Sam earlier interviewed a guy who would um, spit on his partner's back to show that he like just to kind of like get out of the situation almost. And um, is that his yeah. name or his fake name? No, a Sam is. Oh right, the the guy who's in our group who's conducting. Yeah. So yeah. he interviewed someone who did that yeah um and yeah I mean like mostly it's just like it is just sort of giving them the wrong idea so I think a lot of people are really good at that <laughs> oh you know what actually I this totally slipped my mind until you said that but uh yeah Casey the the gay man who I interviewed he also was able to fake uh the ex ejaculate he was able to fake ejaculating but he didn't use spit like the other guy did he would actually just pee a very little amount it would be dark no, the okay. person wouldn't know and that and they would think that he had finished and then he would be able to leave the situation wow that is that is legendary yes um I, I know we, got to. yeah <laughs> I mean I I was very surprised by that but also you know I was I was thankful that he was able to admit something like that to me um you know and, and also there's nothing I feel like when you're talking about something as taboo as sex there's really nothing that can truly be weird um honestly because like i People do like getting peed on. Be yeah. Surprised. Be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, we asked about how people continue to mislead their partners. I, I have another, like after sex ends, I have another interesting answer from someone about this. Um, so Janet told me that, yeah, she had a boyfriend in high school and at the time she let him think that he had made her orgasm eight times within an hour and a half. And he just went on believing that afterwards and started telling people about it. And then she was like, well, I can't tell him now because like everybody knows and it'll be, yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I guess just like allowing them to believe the lie and uh, just kind of adjusting uh, what you say to accommodate their perceptions of reality. Totally. And like, even just telling someone like, it was great sex or like, you're the best I ever had, like that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like that's a lot of the answers I got, even though like, you know, the the sex sucked. So, um, and even just saying like, you finished like when you didn't, which um, is what I got in Celeste and Betsy. Yeah. Uh, we, We also asked people, do you feel as though you're inclined to be dishonest about other things in a relationship? Now, um, I had one participant say yes, but it wasn't really connected to the sex or really to who she is in a relationship. She says that she has been recently diagnosed with ADHD. And a symptom of that is just like, the compulsion to tell very small and consequential fibs, like saying that she's heard a song that she hadn't heard before, or that she really likes a movie that she knows she hasn't actually seen. So I thought that was an interesting little side note. It didn't really give me any perspective um, for the question that was being asked, but that's that's the only feedback that I got on that. What about you? Um, I think it's something a little, not really similar, but like she said, like not really, this is Betsy. Mm-hmm. She said like, it does like, um, maybe she interpreted it as the question is because of the sex are you more inclined to be dishonest about other things mm-hmm. but um she said not because of the sex but mostly because of like other factors of our relationship right or like like more like possessing issues or like you know just stuff like that so um It wasn't more about the sex, but everyone else said, um, I mean, Celeste said yes, um, Mm -hmm. mostly because I, I don't know if I can say this, (laughs) but, um, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, mostly because like, I don't think that she's happy with her relationship. Uh, yeah. But, um, I don't know. And then troll said no so it was just like it was varying answers for me Mm -hmm. um yeah so we we also asked people why they why they fake sexual satisfaction and why they think other people fake it um and again those are those answers that we've been hearing all along and talking about which is um either i i want to spare my partner's feelings or i want the sex to be over and so i'm trying to indicate that i'm done um and those are the two main reasons that I found. Yeah, um, it was, yeah, it was definitely the same, like, to leave the situation or to just, like, make them feel better, and I think that is, like, the trend that we're seeing overall. Yes. Questions. Um, and then, then we asked people, are there ever times when you engage in sexual activity when you aren't fully interested? Um, and I got like some varying answers. It was just like, yeah, um, because I said earlier or like, because I feel bad or, mm-hmm. and then just cause like they, it was mostly yes. Cause they want to please the other person. They, yeah. they just don't want like the other person to be mad at them because they mm-hmm. feel abused. So yeah. I had some feedback that told me, um, yes, because I'll get distracted when we're like making out or something. And then it'll, and she told me, this is Janet again. She's like, 
I'll just zone out and then all of a sudden we'll be in the middle of sex and I'm like I totally get that and also that makes sense with her ADHD you know what I mean yeah Um, yeah. and I I also feel like I can relate to that like you just kind of go on autopilot sometimes and then you're like wait do I really want to be doing this like what's happening um Another answer was a little bit more dark, but I think it's important to note because of the topic that we're discussing. And um, Casey was telling me about how sometimes that he had been in situations that um, began consensually, but then there were elements to it that were not consensual. So um, like one issue uh, that I think is worth talking about is stealthing. Are you familiar with the term stealthing? No. It's when um, two partners agree to have sex with a condom. And then the penetrating partner stealthily takes it off when the other partner can't see. And that's called stealthing. Um, And it is, in the eyes of the law, considered a form of rape. I don't know if that's in all 50 states, um, but I know that it has been found to be rape in the past. And I agree ideologically that that is a huge violation. Yeah, totally. I would hope that's against the law in all 50 states Um, yes um so yeah there there's so that was Casey that was experiencing yes uh he had experienced stealthing he had experienced some people that he had met on Grindr that he just ended up not trusting and not liking the vibe but was like too scared to say no um and so just like a, a myriad of different situations and I actually paused the recording on our interview um to just kind of talk to him about that friend to friend uh, before we proceeded, because um, I, I wanted him to have a chance off the record to um, let me know what his needs were, um, and he's he's he was fine. He's um, a really wonderful person and friend, and I'm glad we got to have that discussion together. But it is hard to hear. Yeah, no, that's never good news to hear that. Mm-hmm rape occurred you know I know like I was not expecting to be like crying in my interview but and then I was like I can't let him know that I'm crying about this right because it's his trauma yeah you know um but I just I love him so much he's one of my oldest friends for sure um and so um I I really appreciated him opening up to me about that yeah I'm really glad I'm glad that y'all got the chance to open up and yeah interview Mm -hmm. because that is things that we need to talk about yeah yeah he can be very walled off um and so it was was nice to have a vulnerable moment with him um but before we get too deep into my friends and (laughs) their lives um we can we we can segue i guess into the next question which is does speaking satisfaction ever make the experience more pleasurable for you um and in one case um the feedback for me was yes um I got yes by the girls so only the guy said no Mm -hmm. which I thought was very very interesting but like it's more about them feeling that it helps them in the situation as well Mm -hmm. so yeah I think with um the male I had he didn't really get to experience more of the faking sexual pleasure as the women he didn't have too much experience in that because he only has faked it with one sexual partner but um overall like the women who have faked it with multiple have felt that it does benefit them too because of that um because it turns them on more a little bit yeah exactly um then we asked um with whom have you faked sexual satisfaction now um casey gave me an estimate that out of the 73 73 people with whom he'd slept um probably i think 65 percent or 60 yeah so he, he estimated that 60% of that group he had faked it with. Um, and I think that came out to be like 35 people total. Um, but that's his math, um, not mine. And um, Janet told me she'd only faked it with four or five people. And then Clara 
who I've not talked about so much because she had the shortest interview, but she did give me really good answers. Um, she told me that she had faked it with every single one of her partners. And I think that that was, um, that was just six people for her, but, um, I like- had a very similar interviewee, Celeste. Um, she faked it with all seven of her partners. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like I definitely, and then, um, Bessie, like, she said that she's faked it with half and she's had 30 sexual partners. So around 15. And she said, this is a later question, but I think it's important to note here Mm -hmm. is that um, she felt like as she grew older um, and like wiser and like has kind of matured in like her sexual encounters and stuff like that, she thought it was better for her to like not fake it and like communicate what she wanted and like you Mm -hmm. know get the most out of the sex that she was getting in the moment so I thought that was very interesting and then Trolls has faked it with wait what were we even talking about we're talking about um the question I uh, moved on to a different question huh that's okay yeah we yeah we can move on um oh no no which one I'm sorry well 24 and 25 if you're looking at the list oh yeah so then Charles has only faked it with like some random girl he met in Mexico Mm -hmm. in his words (laughs) (laughs) that's so good yeah right (laughs) um yeah uh so you talking about like your interview you kind of maturing and then you know uh, not faking it so much. Uh, that's similar to what Janet told me. She said that she began faking sexual pleasure first as a way to escape coercive situations. She wanted it to be over, and so she wanted to indicate that she had had an orgasm in the hopes that the other person would stop doing what they were doing. Then, um, as she um, moved into more consensual relationships, thankfully, uh, she would fake sexual pleasure just um to soothe the other person's ego and now she what she does she just doesn't fake it at all she says that she described it as having mini sex ed in the middle of sex and she she this is like a direct quote she's like (laughs) where um she's like let's find the clitoris best or this is what a clitoris is let's find her bestie like that's what I love that that is awesome (laughs) yeah wow yeah you got I guess you gotta be really confident or I don't even know like just like just like really open with people to communicate what you want Mm -hmm. it's hard it's really hard yeah she's a very confident person and it was interesting to see how she kind of was able to detail her growth like that over the years I love that for her me too that's amazing (laughs) that is amazing if only I could do that right um then there's this question with whom have you not faked sexual satisfaction um and the 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 difference between those partners and the partners with whom participants did fake sexual satisfaction was primarily that they either didn't fake it because they actually were satisfied or they didn't fake it because they didn't care enough to pretend that they were satisfied. Yeah, it, I got the same answers pretty much. It was, it's mostly like, I don't know, they just, it was, it was just more about like enjoying to be with them or not like hating them for not being into it. So like, mm-hmm. wait, sorry. No, it's like, it, it was just more like uh, close partners that they were with. Right. So um, they just felt more comfortable. Like people that they were more comfortable with is who they felt that they didn't have to fake it. Yeah. Is more my consensus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we asked, um, describe your most successful relationship, including details about your time together in a non-sexual capacity. And that was, I got, um, <laughs> I just got like, we vibe. Like that's yeah. why, like that, that was like their most successful relationship is Celeste. She said that we vibe. And we get along with each other like friends. Um, and then for communicating about your sexual satisfaction, um, most of them said it was like kind of speaking up about um, 
like speaking up with that partner more than they have with anyone else because I think of the duration of their relationship Mm -hmm. um and then like telling their partner like hey like this is what I need um but it wasn't like that at the beginning of the relationship it only got to a point where they were fed up yeah where I saw it yeah so for my participants um I had two really interesting answers um, so for Clara's most successful relationship, she described her current relationship, which uh, they've been together four years and are currently long distance. Um, she says that they're very open um, about sex and, um, you know, trying to be equally satisfied. But because of the distance, um, she does say that it can be awkward to communicate sometimes. She said it's like there's... Um, mm-hmm you know, they have to remember how to be together when they see each other again in person. And that's something that we kind of bonded over during the interview, because I'm also in a long distance relationship. And I kind of described it as being like two different relationships, one that I have with them digitally when we're communicating online, and then the relationship that we have in person. And it's, it is very, very different. So um, I was able to personally kind of understand where she was coming from with that. Um, So Uh, I think the success of the relationship did have a lot to do with just the person. Um, But then uh, Janet gave me a really great story um, for hers. So I I told her that relationship was defined for the purpose of this study. Um, However, the participant wanted to define it, whether it be like a one night stand or a years long monogamous relationship. And Janet told me that her most successful relationship uh, began when she was at a party and um, the president of the frat that was hosting the party invited her to come look at his kitten that he had rescued and uh, so a bunch of people came with him to go look at this cat and he kicked all of them out and so she started to leave too and then he was like nope not you and so she stayed and then he offered her whiskey she'd never had it before and she really enjoyed it and like to this day she loves whiskey and then um and then eventually one thing led to another they started hooking up um, but she's very loud as she describes herself as a quote unquote loud bitch. Um, and so she stops and she's like, I think everyone at this party like can hear me right now. And so he gets up and he walks out to the party and he says, party's over, everybody go home. And he kicks everybody out of the house and everybody leaves. And then they resume having sex. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's- awesome i know janet has the best stories um <laughs> she sounds like a great person she's the one who can hang people. she can hang yes yes <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so also apparently if you sleep with a fraternity president there's you're supposed to be given a toaster by the frat and she never got it and she was really mad about that yeah. but anyway um so he was very gentlemanly the next day like he called her an uber and he was like, let me get your number. And she's like, you're not going to text me. Like, don't pretend like you want my number. It's fine. And he's like, no, like, I really want to see you again. And then they went out a few times. Um, he gave her mono, which I actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Christmas break happened. They were going to see each other again, but then she was sick. And so they just didn't see each other. But it was like, they hooked up once and then they had a brief courtship and that was it. And she said that that was her most successful relationship because it was just fun all around it was consensual they were both interested in each other and just um yeah she just really emphasized the 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 consent aspect of everything like in in efforts to make her comfortable yeah um so moving on to the next question I guess (laughs) um how does a partner's ignorance to your dissatisfaction impact your outlook on the relationship Oh, I got a good one for this. So, um, Celeste, she said, it annoys me and makes me fed up with the relationship. Sex is a huge part of the relationship. So when I feel like he doesn't care about pleasing me, it makes me feel like he doesn't care about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got the similar answer in Betsy. Um, It's just like, it just makes her feel like that her satisfaction doesn't matter. Well, I don't know. Charles, Charles doesn't really have anything to say about that. But like, I don't know. I feel like the overall theme was just like, like if they don't care about having sex, 
like making you feel good like Mm -hmm. they don't care about anything which is very like a polarized view but it does make sense because sex is a huge part of the relationship I yeah I agree completely um like uh so both Janet and Casey kind of said the same thing where they're like this is the most intimate thing that we will ever do together and if you can't you know be perceptive of how I'm feeling and what I need from you then how am I going to trust you and other aspects of our relationship um one thing that one thing that Casey made a point of saying was like he was like you know the vast majority of people like statistically will never see these parts of me that you are now getting to see and that's such an intimate thing and it's such a privileged experience and so if I can't you know if you don't understand me then that's really that's that's a disappointment yeah I completely I can totally see that Mm -hmm. um we talked about um, if you're unable to achieve sexual satisfaction, how does this affect your self-esteem? Um, none of my participants really had an issue achieving sexual satisfaction um, and there weren't really any um, self-esteem consequences. Um, for how do you think this affects your partner's self-esteem? Like if you can't achieve orgasm, they said that they, you know, hypothetically they would think that their partners would feel bad if they knew they weren't able to orgasm. Yeah, I got very similar answers. If it's more like it annoys me more than it affects my self-esteem, but like they know that their partner feels very insecure about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we asked, can you describe a time when you try to redirect your partner's efforts in order to provide you with better physical pleasure? And a lot of my people said like they started like bringing different things into the bedroom like more of like like toys and like kind of describing like their wants needs and like different fantasies they have Mm -hmm. um and and they they like to do like some um like different I guess like dirty talk over text or something but um mostly all of them said like just by like changing it up and like just changing it all up (laughs) yeah um so I actually was working from a pdf of the protocol so I didn't use the updated like google document and this was a um question that we added like after we had submitted it for professor feedback and then she was like you should ask about this so I actually didn't ask my subjects about this um but that's the only one that I didn't ask them about so uh, we're otherwise on the same page (laughs) okay um but they did anecdotally still kind of describe this um for example Janet talking about um just blatantly saying here's what you need to do here's what's not working yeah I mean it can just be as simple as that too uh-huh. Um, then we asked about something that is very personal. We asked, are you able to achieve sexual satisfaction by yourself? Um, Clara said yes, but she didn't really elaborate. And so we didn't go in depth on this. Um, I keep trying not to say their real names <laughs> and I, you know, um, and then Casey, yeah, Casey told me, um, that he is, and he feels like it's, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the differences. Um, and then, and then Janet said yes as well. Um, and so the, the question was why have sex with a partner then? What does a partner contribute beyond physical pleasure? Um, what's the difference between sex and masturbation? Um, and I thought they both, um, so Clara didn't really give me a lot for this one, but Janet and Casey did. And so Janet said that she thinks that sex and masturbation are kind of like the same thing. She says that um, she feels like masturbating is having sex with herself and she it's important for her to love and appreciate herself as much as a partner would or as much as she would want a partner to. And so that's something that's like very important to her. And she, she says that um, by masturbating, she has a healthy sexual relationship with herself, which I really respected. Um, Casey, on the other hand, said that masturbation um, 
is is different from sex um and it's and and it, yeah it's, it's just a very different experience to where um he could get something out of either but would usually prefer a partner yeah I got um basically like the same inner like the same answers throughout all of my interviews and it was like all of them masturbated and then um mostly like people said the reason why they have sex versus masturbation is just because they know that someone wants to fuck them and knows that someone like wants to like give them that desire that they want which they find is a benefit um and mostly because I mean also like you can't deny like it's a different feeling too so yes uh that was something that Janet said too was that partners give her different types of orgasms than she can give herself Mm -hmm. also she um brought something up that I don't think we've gotten into yet which is the uh, topic of BDSM she said that she's into like some kinky stuff that she can't do by herself yeah I mean there there are a lot of things that like requires a partner I guess yeah um, <laughs> but I, I don't know I, I I guess my interviewees I guess they weren't open about that or I don't know they didn't really give me yeah any fun stuff to work with yeah um I I mean literally so Janet and um Casey are literally two of my very best friends so they gave me like some juicy shit and a lot of stuff I already kind of knew about but then they like went into details that I hadn't heard before um so I feel like that really was a benefit to the data (laughs) um great time too yeah we asked how does your sexual relationship with someone impact the rest of your relationship outside of a sexual capacity uh what did you get for this one um I got very different answers it's mostly like if the sex is good, you can ignore your partner's flaws more Mm -hmm. because you're kind of addicted to the sex. But when the sex goes like is bad is what, um, wait, hold up. But like, yeah, so like mostly when the sex is good, you can just like ignore your partner's flaws because you're kind of addicted to the sex, but like, um, but then Kate Celeste thought that like, if the sex is bad, everything else starts going bad and like it affects other problems with the relationship, like, um, like just getting easily annoyed or like just being irritable too. Right. Is what she said. Um, my, I'm looking, I like searching through my answers right now. Um, let me find what Clara said, because I haven't talked a lot about her, but I really do appreciate her feedback. And as the only person I interviewed who's in a long-term relationship, I feel like that's actually valuable. So I'm going to see what she has to say with the, about this. Um, so she says, here's a direct quote from the transcript. I feel like, you know, not having the sexual part down, you're missing that sort of chemistry, which I do think is a really important, is really important to have to work. Sorry, I'm going to start over because I'm misreading. Okay. I feel like, you know, not having the sexual part down, you're missing that sort of chemistry, which I do think is really important to have or work on in a relationship because it's human nature. I thought that was a very good way to put it. And she did a good job answering that question. Yeah, because it totally is human nature to feel the same way like sex makes you feel you know what I mean yeah oh um here's here's an answer that I forgot about that that I think is very good also for the why have sex with a partner if you can um if you can have sex like if you can masturbate um Casey told me that he gets an adrenaline rush out of it and so I know I mentioned this earlier, but he's a PhD student. He's very, very gifted. He's 22 years old. Um, it's a very young age to be pursuing a doctorate, 
Um, he's on an incredibly accelerated path and it's a lot of high pressure. And so something that he does sometimes to get his blood pumping is he'll just like have a random late night hookup when he's like in the midst of like a lot of like deadlines and shit. Um, wow. And I thought that was pretty crazy, pretty interesting. Um, like during the, the, and the time we've been talking, my partner messaged me and was like, hey, are we going to have time to like call tonight? And I'm like so stressed out. I'm like, no, like I can't even <laughs> think about you right now. But um, because because like, right, I want to get this done. I want to get all my other schoolwork done. But then mm-hmm. with Casey, he's like, no, I like needs a little bit of like amorous attention. And then I'm like reset and I can work again. So uh, I thought that was interesting. I think that's very cool. And I respect that a lot because I mean, not going to lie, like having a lot of stress, it's easy just to be like, oh my God, this is what I need right now. And just do like a quick fix and then yeah. go on with your work. Mm-hmm. So I, I do respect that. Um So my interview kind of ends there because the rest did not have um, the requirements for the rest of the questions. Right. It was if you ever, if you ever had a partner fake it with you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I had one person get this part. So um, I'll just try to very quickly break it down since we're dealing with just one participant and thus it's going to be pretty anecdotal. Um, but basically Casey told me that he had one partner, um, say that it was very good in the, um, like in the moment and then like three hours later or something, Casey had been like performing for this person, um, for two hours. And during those two hours that the person was like very receptive and gave like a lot of positive feedback, but then several hours later he just blatantly said yeah it was awful it was horrible I hated it and he was very harsh about it um and it it felt really terrible for Casey first of all because like of the duration of the sexual encounter it was so long he he had um you know worked to pleasure this person for such a large amount of time that it was embarrassing for him to find out that it hadn't been effective But then also the way that he found out about it, it was just very degrading for the partner to say it was horrible. I didn't like it. Um, And so that kind of that story kind of answers a lot of these remaining questions. Um, How do you feel when a partner is unable to become aroused? Well, he didn't know at first and then he felt terrible. Um, At what point in the relationship, whatever that may be, did you realize your partner was faking sexual pleasure? Right. It wasn't immediately after it was several hours. Um, and he found out, uh, which is the next question, because he told him um, the amount of time between the deception and the reveal did impact um, Casey's feelings quite a bit. Because um, if he had said right afterwards, you know, then that would have been easier to contend with. Um, the yeah. Re- yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this situation? I mean, I just think that was really rude. I mean, there's a reason. I mean, I, I just think that there there is a reason why people do fake sexual pleasure and it's not, and, it, and it's it's just not to like break your partner's self-esteem, you know? Cause it, it, it like having sex with someone is such a personal thing and it, it does kind of like, I don't know, it, it's kind of like, I don't even want to say like it shows your worth to your partner but like it it makes you feel like if you're performing better then like your partner will enjoy you more is what I have gathered is like the overall feeling towards sex and I don't know for him to just like just like bluntly say that it's just like wow man like if you Mm -hmm. could fake it for like that long why be honest yeah um so uh the reveal obviously did lead to kind of a confrontation um which is question 36 question 37 um Casey felt very confident in his sexual abilities before the reveal and then afterwards his confidence was just kind of shattered um then the last question is was the partner dishonest about other aspects of the relationship the answer was yes um the guy that he had hooked up with used a photo of himself on Grinder that actually wasn't a picture of him um in the first place so and I actually should have gotten better clarification about this you know I should have been like all right were any of his pictures real or did he look similar to that like or how did you decide you wanted to 
hook up with him anyway. Um, but yes, he was just a dishonest person. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That is just a really fucked up situation. I know. It's just a really fucked up situation. Grinder is scary, is what I learned from my interview with Casey. I don't even know how I feel about these apps nowadays. It's like, <laughs> like, are these people real? Are they just catfishing me? Mm-hmm. Are you just here for sex? Are you here for like me? Who knows? <laughs> but that, that is really sad what happened to Casey. Yeah. Um, but that's a breakdown of our entire protocol. Um, thanks so much for lending your time to this part two, because I know you did so much to um, contribute to the part one as well. Um, and I'm really excited to proceed with this project and move into the writing phase. Me too. I think we did pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for listening. That is our entire protocol. All right. Signing off. This is Anna. And Anne Elizabeth. <laughs> hey.